Hi, everyone. So in this lecture, we are going to be looking at air pollution. It settles down on the industrial town of Donora, Pennsylvania, and brings with it mysterious death. Residents have difficulty in breathing the murky air. 20 die, 400 others are stricken with respiratory ailments. Oxygen tents care for sufferers in the town's community center, transformed into a hospital. Investigations are launched. A local zinc plant suspected of emitting poison smoke is closed down. Rain brings relief, but an epidemic of pneumonia is feared in the wake of Donora's deadly plague of smog. All right. So that uh, old-timey newsreel that you just watched was describing the deadly Donora smog of 1948. Now, Donora was or is a small town located 30 miles south of Pittsburgh, and it was a farming community originally that transitioned into a steel manufacturing community in the early 1900s. And in 1948, there was this air pollution disaster, right? It started on October 27th. Smog filled the town, and it lasted until the 31st. And at the end of this event... There were 20 people dead and over 14, well, anywhere from 5,000 to 14,000 people that were injured, right? That got sick from this air pollution event. And there was la long lasting effects as well, right? The rates of cancer and cardiovascular disease increased in this town in the following years. Oh, let me see if I can get to it, right? So here are just some images, a couple more images, right? Here's the town right here. You could see the factories out in the back. Uh, emitting air pollution. And here's uh, an image of the Main Street downtown, right? And see how it's hazy. Uh, that's not just the quality of the, the photo. Uh, that is the, the fog or the smog in the town at the time. So that's the Donora smog of 1948. Let's look at another smog event. This is the Great Smog of London in 1952, right? Now, this started in December 5th, and... Uh, on this day, there was a yellow brown fog 30 miles wide that covered the city and it covered for five days. And you can see the images right here. And it was caused from a mix of coal chimneys. It was cold, right? It was a cold uh, in the beginning of December and people were heating their homes with coal, factory smokestacks, cars, diesel buses that had recently replaced. They had an electric tram system originally. And all these things were pumping pollutants into the air. And like I said, it lasted for five days. And this was especially deadly. By the end of this, it's estimated that 8,000 to 12,000 people died. So both of these events are good examples of the um, effect that air pollution can have on human health, right? And these are both acute example. So it is um, sudden. A lot of air pollution happens. There are these sudden medical effects that that impact a lot of people in a short amount of time. Right. And like we said, it, it highlights the um, effect the negative effect, the toll that air pollution takes on human health. But besides these acute incidents, um, air pollution has long ranging effects that we don't actually recognize, right? And it's kind of the insidious nature of it. It kind of goes back to what we talked about in earlier lectures where that idea of discounting, right? Often um, the negative or the environmental impacts of pollutants, and in this case, the human impacts of pollutants, um, aren't readily recognized because they happen in long term. And that's what we see um, with air pollution at these lower levels, right? So you can have these acute events where there's um, high levels of air pollution that have a, a drastic uh, health effect uh, very quickly, right? Like those two smog events. But over the long term, if you are exposed to lower levels of pollutants in the ambient air, which is the air that is just around us, it can greatly impact human health, increase our risk of stroke, lung cancer, and asthma, and it's ultimately resulting in earlier deaths for millions of humans across the globe, right? And in fact, uh, a 2022 UN report estimates that 7 million people die annually due to air pollution, right? Which is a huge number. And this is only talking about deaths, right? That's just one aspect, which is a horrible thing. People are dying, but this isn't uh, doesn't take in consideration um, 
illnesses that uh, people are experiencing throughout all this, the healthcare costs that cover all this, days of missed work, et cetera. When you wrap all this together, right, putting number values on this, air pollution has a huge toll, uh, both from a human health standpoint, and then if we are trying to quantify it from a, a cost standpoint, right, from money, actual dollars, uh, it has a huge toll that it takes on um, country, cities, human population. So when we are talking about air pollutants, we should recognize what are these pollutants of concern, right? We're talking about air pollution. What are the exact um, uh, pollutants that we need to be worried about? Now, we can classify these pollutants in a number of ways, but probably the easiest way is to look at criteria pollutants and non-criteria pollutants. And this is really related to the Clean Air Act. And we'll talk about the Clean Air Act a little bit later in this lecture. But part of what the Clean Air Act did is it established these national ambient air quality standards, right? And it looked at pollutants that contributed the largest volume of air quality degradation and considered to have the most serious threat to human health. And it uh, targeted them. And it set up these, uh, like I said, these air quality standards. So when we are measuring the air or we are measuring these pollutants in the air, uh, we want them below these standards, right? So when this was being established, it, it uh, they uh, essentially established six criteria pollutants, right? So taking into consideration what's being produced the most and what has the most serious set to human health, they found that there were six pollutants that they wanted to focus on, and they set these uh, ambient air quality standards for them. So those six pollutants are sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, lead, ozone, and particulate matter. Right, and as you see over here, here are these ambient air quality standards for all of them. Right here are our pollutants. Right here are our criteria pollutants. And these standards are based on different amounts of time. Right, you could have a standard set for exposure for eight hours or uh, or one hour. Right, and you would average this out. Right, over the course of the year, on average, they want you to be exposed to less than 53 ppbs or parts per billion of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, etc. Right. And you can see all these um, uh, standards right here. And important to know that these have changed right throughout the course of the years. And we'll get into this a little bit when, we, like I said, we talk about the Clean Air Act. Uh, but these are evaluated by the EPA uh, throughout the course of this Clean Air Act. And they have um, been altered, essentially made more stringent as the years have gone by, as we recognize further the, the impacts that air pollutants have on our health. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at these six criteria pollutants. And then we're going to look at some non-criteria pollutants. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about weather patterns and how that affects the movement of these pollutants. And then we'll see what we have done to try and reduce them in our atmosphere. So we're going to start with sulfur dioxide, right? SO2, one molecule of sulfur, two of oxygen. Sulfur dioxide, um, gets into the air in a number of ways. But really what we're going to see for all of these criteria pollutants is that almost all of them are getting into the air through the burning of fossil fuels, right? And whether that is we're burning them for um, electricity generation or burning them for transportation, right, in our cars, almost all of them are um, being emitted through the burning of fossil fuels. And in particular, when we're talking about sulfur dioxide, it is through the burning of coal, right? That's how the majority of sulfur dioxide gets into the atmosphere, right? For electricity generation, using uh, coal plants, burning coal to create uh, electricity. Now, there is good news, and we'll talk a little bit about this, like I said, uh, in a, at the end of this lecture, when we talk about what we've done to reduce this. But if we were talking just about uh, electricity generation and using coal, we have reduced our use of coal um, uh, recently, right? So if you go all the way back here to 2010, coal made up for about 45% of our power, right, of our power generation. Now it is down to under 20%. It's largely been replaced by natural gas and um, some more uh, renewables, which uh, we will get into later on in this course. And that's a good thing because burning coal um, out of those fossil fuels, coal is probably the dirtiest when it comes to emissions, right? 
they are all going to emit these air pollutants, uh, but coal is the worst offender when it comes to it. So switching to natural gas has led to an improvement in air quality, um, even though it still results in the emissions uh, of these pollutants. So that's the primary way that sulfur dioxide gets into the uh, gets into the air and the atmosphere. Um, but there are other ways as well. If you are using fuel oil, right, it will contain sulfur often. So uh, that fuel oil can be used to heat your homes or can fuel trucks or ships, right? And if it contains sulfur, when that burns off, it creates sulfur dioxide. The smelting of uh, sulfide ores to extract different types of metals. Uh, can result in emissions. And there are also natural emissions of sulfur dioxide, volcanoes, hydrogen sulfide producing organisms, and the erosion of uh, soils that contain sulfate can all contribute to sulfur dioxide uh, emissions. Now, this is um, a problem. Sulfur dioxide is something to be concerned about because it has health effects, right? Like we talked about, they're all going to have health effects. Uh, it can result in breathing problems, particularly in those suffering from asthma. The in the short term, people can get chest tightness, coughing, wheezing. And in the long term, you can have damage to your lungs and an aggravation of cardiovascular disease. And we're going to see these health effects uh, are pretty standard across the board for, for almost all of these pollutants. But sulfur dioxide is also troubling because of another effect, and that is its effect it has on the environment. So sulfur dioxide can combine with water vapor in the atmosphere, forming sulfuric acid. And then that will fall to the ground in the form or what we refer to as acid rain, uh, which was a, a much bigger issue uh, in the in the 90s than it is now because we dealt with it. And we'll talk about that. But that acid rain, right, would had damaging effects on lakes, um, wetlands, even terrestrial environments. Right. It killed aquatic life. It damaged plants. And it was a serious environmental concern. Uh, so serious that we dealt with it, right, in a very responsible and appropriate way. Um, so that's sulfur dioxide. Next, we have nitrogen oxides, right? So nitrogen oxides are uh, two gases primarily, nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. And they are formed when nitrogen in fuel or in the air um, is heated during combustion, again, burning of fossil fuels, to temperatures above 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the presence of oxygen, right? So often that initial product is nitric oxide, and then that gets further oxidized, so it gets turned into nitrogen dioxide. Um, but we kind of consider both of them as this pollutant, right? So when we are talking about nitrogen oxides, how are they getting into the air, right? Our sulfur dioxide was primary through the burning of coal for electricity. Our nitrogen oxides is primarily through transportation or um, they are getting emitted through car exhaust, right? It's the burning of gasoline results in the production of nitrogen oxides and that gets emitted through your car tailpipe. Now it's also, they also get emitted through electricity generation, right? If we're burning coal, oil or natural gas in those power plants, it's producing some nitrogen oxides. There are some natural sources as well. But really, it's if we're talking about what is the most, right, what's generating the most, it is transportation, your car exhaust, right? And again, if we're looking at health effects, it's going to be similar to what we saw with sulfur dioxide, right? Aggravated respiratory diseases, um, asthma, right? Particularly, uh, it, it aggravates asthma, um, coughing, wheezing, difficulty breathing, right? Can contribute to the development of asthma. Uh, it affects, it also can uh, contributes to acid rain, which we just talked about, right? That nitrogen dioxide can react with water vapor to form nitric acid, which you see in this process down here, right? It's reacting with water vapor. And then also very importantly, nitrogen dioxide can react um, with other chemicals in the air uh, to form both particulate matter and ozone. And both of those are probably the two most that, um, important pollutants or pollutants that have the, the greatest danger or effect on human health, which we're going to talk about, right? So the, you could see here that this nitrogen dioxide here is interacting and it's the, it uses uh, in the atmosphere, the energy from the sun um, interacts with this nitrogen dioxide and other oxygen molecules in there to form ozone. And 
uh, ozone, like we, like I just said, it has a, a very negative uh, effect on human health, and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about it when we get to it, right? But another important effect of nitrogen oxides. Okay, so we had sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides. Now we're going to talk about carbon monoxide. And again, if we're talking about where is carbon monoxide or how is it getting into the air, it's through your car exhaust primarily, right? If you look at our pie chart up here, transportation is the biggest chunk of it, right? And just like all of these, it's that burning of fossil fuels. Here we're burning gasoline, right? It's a product of oil. And through uh, the combustion of that, um, it is releasing carbon monoxide. Now, it's not just in transportation, but um, carbon monoxide can be um, emitted through the burning of other fuels, coal, oil, charcoal, natural gas, right, which you may get in your furnaces if you have a gas furnace um, or your engines, right, like your car engines or um, uh, portable generators, right, could have a, are a, a danger with carbon monoxide especially in the home, and we'll talk about indoor um, air or indoor air pollutants in the next lecture. But primarily, right, it's coming through your car exhaust. And there's natural sources as well, right? Any sort of combustion um, of carbon can release carbon monoxide. And when we were talking about health and environmental effects, well, from the health effect, it's more that acute, right? So it can block oxygen uptake in your blood, Right. So uh, the danger, especially in your home, if you have uh, certain leaks or that there you are emitting carbon dioxide, whether through a furnace or a stove, et cetera, um, it could uh, that buildup of carbon monoxide um, will uh, bind to your hemoglobin, prevents oxygen from binding to your hemoglobin and uh, will cause death. Right. I mean, you, you've I'm sure you've probably heard of stories of carbon monoxide poisoning, right? So why you have carbon monoxide detectors in your homes. But uh, carbon monoxide also has a larger environmental effect. And that is because about 90% of it gets converted to carbon dioxide. And when we talk about climate change, we're going to see carbon dioxide is one of the main greenhouse gases that we need to be worried about that is altering uh, our climate. And again, we'll get into that when we start looking at climate change. Carbon dioxide, we're not going to focus on uh, in this air pollutant because we're we're going to um, focus solely on it or put a larger focus on it when we talk about climate change. Okay, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide. Now we're going to talk about lead, right? Our fourth uh, criteria pollutant. So... How does lead get into the air? Again, we're looking at transportation, but it's a little bit different this time. It's not car exhausts anymore, right? Historically, it was. Historically, there was leaded gasoline. And now if you go to the, uh, if you drive up to the gas pumps now, you will always see unleaded, right? That was started in the 70s, largely as a response to this, right? When that gas was burning, that gas was um was burned that had lead in it. It, it uh, um, allows that lead to emit into the atmosphere and it had uh, huge health effects, right? It affects the nervous system of vertebrates and kidney function and immune system and the development system. And importantly, it'll affect the neurological development in children, right? So children that are exposed to lead in the atmosphere have lower IQs typically, they may have behavioral problems and learning deficits, right? So lead is still emitted into the air, albeit at a much lesser amount than historically. And where it gets into the air now is still through leaded fuel. But now that uh, leaded fuel is not for your cars, but it's still used in certain uh, aircraft, uh, particularly piston engine aircraft, which are like smaller private planes or like Cessnas that you might use. And lead also gets emitted through processing of ore and metals, particularly lead smelting, right? So they're trying to get lead to then be used in batteries or pipes or wires, ammunition. Through that process, there can be emissions of lead into the air, uh, albeit much uh, smaller than historically. So I already kind of talked about some of the health effects. Those carry over to all, uh, to multiple vertebrates, not just humans, right? Those neurological effects. And we could see decreased growth and reproduction in plants and animals as well. Okay, now we're getting to our um, uh, our our two um, criteria pollutants that have the largest effect on human health: ozone and particulate matter. And these are also interesting because both of these are also um, aggregates, 
right? So on those other ones, they're basically just one chemical, right? Sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides are two, um, but carbon monoxide, lead, they're all just one chemical compound. Here, ozone is actually produced from a number of other pollutants, right? So it's kind of a secondary pollutant, right? There's all these primary pollutants, right? VOCs are, are some of them, and nitrogen dioxides are some of them, and they interact at the, with uh, chemicals in the atmosphere and really using energy from the sun to be converted into ozone. Now, ozone is bad. We kind of, I mean, you probably all are familiar with the ozone layer, right? So up in the stratosphere, ozone is important because it blocks UV rays. But at ground level, ozone is a uh, very uh, harmful air pollutant, right? And because it has such a large effect on our lungs, right? And so damaging to our lungs, right? It can cause the muscles in our airways to constrict, trapping air, and that will lead to wheezing and shortness of breath, right? Over the long term, it's contributing to asthma, right? It's aggravating lung disease. It damages your lungs. It makes your lungs more susceptible to infection. So it has uh, really nasty effects on human health. And it also has environmental effects, right? It'll damage sensitive plants um, and sensitive ecosystems. Now, how is ozone getting into the air, right? <coughs> well, we need to look at what are the the precursors to ozone. And I already mentioned them. It's nitrogen dioxide, which we just talked about. We saw that gets into the air primarily through our, our car exhaust, right? And some electricity generation, the burning of coal, oil, and gas. But it's also getting into the air through VOCs or volatile organic compounds. And we'll see these again. But volatile organic compounds, just like nitrogen oxides or nitrogen dioxide, are emitted through your car tailpipes, right? The burning of uh, gasoline or um, carbon-based uh, sources will result in the emission of VOCs. There's also natural emissions, plants emit VOCs as well. Um, but when we're talking about uh, air pollutants, it's really uh, the burning of fossil fuels, right? Whether it's car exhausts or power plants or at refineries that are making uh, different gasolines or different uh, chemical compounds. Right. Uh, so all that is how nitrogen dioxides and VOCs get into the air. And once they're in the air, like I talked about, they interact with different um, molecules in the atmosphere and sunlight and energy from the sun to produce ozone. There's a uh, very bad environmental and health effects. That's going to take us to our last criteria pollutant, right? We saw sulfur dioxides, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, lead, ozone, and now we are looking at particulate matter, the last one. And just like ozone, this one is uh, an aggregate, right? There are multiple things that make up particulate matter. And when we're talking about particular matter, what we are talking about are essentially very fine, solid or liquid particulates that are suspended in the atmosphere. And this could be dust or ash, soot, lint, smoke, pollen, um, algal cells, uh, spores, fungal spores, etc. Right? They're essentially just tiny particles, right? Uh, sulfur dioxide and that sulfuric acid that's formed from acid rain and nitrogen dioxide and nitric acids, all examples, again, of particulate matter, right? This kind of encompasses a lot of these other pollutants. And we can classify particulate matter by the size of the particulates, right? So uh, there are two main uh, classifications that we are concerned with, PM10 and PM2.5. PM10 means that these particulates are 10 micrometers or microns uh, and smaller, right? So if we look at uh, down here, you can see that the human hair, the thickness or diameter is 100 microns. So, right, that would be a tenth of that. Um, something the size of a red blood cell, All right, would be PM10. Uh, so examples would be dust, topsoil, smoke, mold spores, right? The, these are, um, they have a, a negative effect on your human health, right? But perhaps more than just PM10 is PM2.5, right? So these are either smaller um, particles than PM10, right? 2.5 uh, microns, so much smaller uh, than a red blood cell. And these are um, formed 
right, particularly the PM2.5 is related to inefficient combustion of carbon, right? So when we are burning fossil fuels, particularly, right, whether through various ways, uh, electricity, um, during industrial processes, in your homes, as we'll talk about in the next lecture, uh, fire, right, natural uh, sources, um, it will result in the creation of these very, very fine particles. And these are um, so damaging, partly because they are so small, right? Both PM10 and PM2.5 account for one of the biggest health threats from air pollution. And particularly because they can get into your lungs and they can get into your bloodstream, right? They are so tiny, especially as PM2.5. They're smaller than your red blood cells. So they're getting into your lungs and into your bloodstream and having uh, drastic effects on your health, right? They lead to premature death in people with heart or lung disease. They can result in uh, non-fatal heart attacks, irregular heartbeat, asthma, decreased lung function, uh, increased respiratory symptoms like irritation of airways, coughing, difficulty breathing, et cetera. And they also have environmental effects, right? Infect on soil nutrients and water pH, plants and crops, et cetera. Now, there was a, a long-term epidemiological study that looked at the effect of particulate matter, particularly PM2.5, right, exposure on life expectancy. And they found that as you increase exposure to PM2.5 by 10 micrograms per meter cubed, right, an increase of 10 decreases an individual's life expectancy by about three quarters of a year, right? So average exposure, if you are exposed to 10 uh, micrograms per meter cubed of PM 2.5 a year, right? Average exposure, that's going to decrease your life expectancy by about three quarters of a year, which is uh, a, a shocking amount. And it's shocking when you consider that your exposure level, or at least around the globe, there are these really high exposure levels to PM 2.5. The average person in Beijing is exposed to about 100 micrograms per uh, meter cubed a year, right? So that decreases. So just because of that exposure, the average person in Beijing is losing about seven and a half years off of their life because of that exposure, right? Huge impacts on human health, right? And if we go back again, going back to that lecture that I talked about, why should we care about environmental degradation, um, right? Uh, one of those reasons is the utility factor, right? And that was more so what can we get out of nature? But here is utility for us. This is drastically affecting our health. So we, it makes sense that we would be concerned about having clean air because of these huge effects on our human health. And we'll see this again when we look at indoor air quality in later lectures. So those were the main six main criteria pollutants, right, that have these national ambient air quality standards that were established by the Clean Air Act. But we also have non-criteria pollutants that uh, they didn't have those standards established, at least initially, right? And there's a number of them. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them because I think they're interesting or they're particularly um, important to talk about, right? And the first one I want to look at is mercury. So mercury is a powerful neurotoxin that can damage the brain and central nervous system, can lead to uh, developmental defects in children and nerve damage, and it's released into the air primarily through the burning of coal, right? Like, and as we saw earlier, and we'll look again at the end of this lecture, we have reduced our burning of coal, and we've done some other things to help uh, filter out pollutants, but coal is still burned worldwide. It's the main source of energy, particularly in China right now, which is probably why they have such bad air pollution there. So it's still a, it's still a problem worldwide. Now, 75% of human exposure to mercury comes from eating fish. And why this is, is because aquatic bacteria are able to convert airborne mercury into methyl mercury, which is then able to be stored in living tissue, right? So aquatic organisms will take up this methyl mercury, get stored in their tissues. And then as you work your way up the food chain, right? So as uh, other organisms eat those organisms, they build up this mercury in their tissues. And that's referred to as bioaccumulation. So as a result, very large or long-lived predatory fish, such as tuna, right, uh, towards the top of the food chain, are going to have larger amounts of mercury built up in their system, and then are more dangerous for us to then consume. And this uh, mercury has impacted the world, right? So in a survey of freshwater fish from 260 lakes across the United States, 
the EPA found that every fish sampled contains some level of mercury, right? Every fish out of these 260 lakes across the U.S., freshwater lakes, had mercury. Uh, in the U.S. National Institutes of Health estimate that one in 12 American women has more mercury in her blood than it was considered safe by the EPA. And between 300,000 and 600,000 of the 4 million children born each year in the United States are exposed in the womb to mercury levels that could cause diminished intelligence or developmental impairments, right? So huge uh, importance, right? Huge effect that this is having on not only the U.S. population, but the world population, all from this air pollutant. And it's uh, estimated that elevated mercury levels cost the U.S. economy about $8.7 billion each year in higher medical and educational costs and in lost workforce productivity. Again, so this is that idea of that environmental economics, right? Putting a, uh, a dollar amount on the effect of these pollutants. Sometimes it's, it's an easier way to convince people of the, um, the importance of regulating or, or the, the effect that they're having, right? So that's one uh, important non-criteria pollutant. Another important class of non-criteria pollutants are referred to as hazardous air pollutants, right? So these are produced in lesser volume than conventional air pollutants, but are especially toxic or hazardous. And these include uh, examples of these. We'll go into some examples. Those VOCs are a lot of those are hazardous air pollutants, right? And they are carcinogens, right? So they can for that are cancer causing the neurotoxins, mutagens. Teratogens, I think I spelled that right, I'm not positive, uh, but those would be um, cause developmental defects. And other uh, very, very toxic or hazardous pollutants that are often produced in these different industrial processes. Um, now, most of these chemicals are either metals or chlorinated hydrocarbons or those VOCs, volatile organic compounds that I talked about earlier. And like I said, they're produced in chemical plants or petroleum refineries, paper mills. Uh, and they're found as in gasoline vapors or solvents or different components of plastics. Okay, so the last non-criteria pollutant that I want to bring up are chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Now, these were industrial gases that were used from the 1930s to the 1980s widespread, and they were used in refrigerators and air conditioners and your aerosol spray cans, right? And what we found was that uh, what was happening is that these chlorofluorocarbons were being emitted and they were reaching the ozone layer. Now, again, ground level ozone, bad, right? It's one of our criteria pollutants. But ozone in the stratosphere is good, right? It, it forms a protective layer that blocks some of the UV radiation from the sun. But what was happening is that these CFCs are broken down uh, by ultraviolet rays and those chlorine atoms get released into the ozone layer and they cause this chain reaction um, that led to the um, breakdown of ozone, right? So we were emitting these CFCs and they were going into the atmosphere and they were going up into the stratosphere and interacting with the ozone in that layer and the ozone layer and leading to the breakdown of ozone. And this was having, right, this was a serious effect. And we actually saw it, right? We saw a hole develop in the ozone layer, particularly over Antarctica, right? And the world saw this and they realized that they needed to uh, make a change, right? Because that ozone layer is very important. We'll talk about the atmosphere when we talk about climate change. Very important in protecting um, the Earth, right? It, it blocks those UV rays when more energy is coming back. It's raising the temperature, uh, it could have devastating environmental effects, et cetera, right? So we realized this was a huge problem and we needed to address it. And in 1987, world countries came together and they uh, signed the Montreal Protocol, which essentially said that we would phase out most CFCs by 2000. And later we changed that to 1996 because we saw how devastating uh, or the wide ranging effects that this could have. So these countries came together. We all decided we're going to phase out our CFCs. But what we also decided and what we also recognized was that there were um, poorer countries uh, that would struggle with phasing this out. Right. They didn't maybe not have the alternatives that uh, the uh, more developed countries had. and It would be more difficult for these poor countries. So we also established an international fund to assist them in switching to these alternatives. And it was effective. Right. The Montreal Protocol is often cited as the most effective international environmental agreement ever established. And we have cut 
global CFC emissions by more than 95% since 1988, right? So you see this drastic reduction in CFCs. Um, and we, we're seeing that effect now on our ozone layer. Our ozone layer is repairing. And in another 30 odd years, it should be almost back to what it was before the widespread um, emissions of these chlorofluorocarbons, right? You can kind of see it. Here's the hole there, and you can see it being repaired and they, what they expect, right? The amount of ozone, it's increasing, right? So really good su success story, uh, particularly how the world is able to recognize a problem and come together to address it. And we'll see if that happens with climate change. So those are our kind of pollutants of concern, right? We looked at our criteria pollutants. We looked at a couple non-criteria pollutants. What I want to do, excuse me, what I want to do now is talk about how atmospheric processes can affect um, the distribution of these pollutants. And then we're going to look at what we have done to reduce them, right? Particularly in the United States. So when we're talking about atmospheric processes, there's a couple that I want to make note of. The first is wind currents, and this is probably most obvious to all of you, right? These are air pollutants, so they are traveling in the air, and they are going to be affected by the wind, right? It's going to affect where these this pollutant ultimately impacts by these air currents, right? So dust and contaminants can be carried great distances by the wind, right? If we look at this is it's hard, kind of hard to see, but this is Africa right here. And this is dust from the Sahara that gets transported all the way over um, to the Americas, right? Through these wind currents. Now, there are general currents that exist um, on the Earth, right? If we are looking at the equator, uh, where's my pointer? If, if we're looking at the equator, the wind is generally traveling from east to west, right? It's why dust from the Sahara can make it over to the Americas, right? It's traveling in this direction. If we are in our middle latitudes, like we are in the United States, the general wind current is going to be from the west to the east, right? And that's referred to as westerlies, right? So as a result, right, we could see this, um, the deposition of pollutants, often we will see it to the east of where the pollution source is, right? And here's an example down here. It's kind of, again, kind of hard to see. This is um, the northeast of, uh, north of uh, the U.S., and this is uh, eastern Canada over here and you can see that the pollution sources was coming from the United States. Here's the Great Lakes. There you go as a reference. But where we were seeing the acid rain precipitation mostly was over here in Canada to the east, right? We were the source was coming from here and it was getting the the westerlies were were um, transporting that those pollutants right through the wind to over here in eastern Canada and that's where we were seeing the effects. It's gonna, this is going to touch on this This movement of pollution is why uh, we have to make modifications to the original Clean Air Act, which we're going to talk about, right? We'll come back to this. So that's one important process. The other is this grass, grasshopper transport. And this I want to highlight just because uh, of um, it's interesting, right? It's interesting um, how these pollutants move, right? So um, this grasshopper transport refers to uh, volatile compounds that evaporate in warmer atmospheres, and then they travel to the poles where it gets colder, and then they get deposited, right? They condense in these colder areas, and then they're going to bioaccumulate, just like we saw with mercury. So if we go to the Arctic up here, we see that whales and polar bears, sharks, other top car carnivores have dangerously high levels of pesticides and metals and other hazardous air pollutants in their bodies. Sorry, my dog is throwing up. And in fact, the Inuit people, right, well above the Arctic Circle, where you think there we are not emitting pollution, right? But these people have the higher, uh, have the highest levels of PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls in their blood than any other known population, and it's due to this effect. Right. So this is, again, where this air pollution does not stay in one place. Right. And it can have you can have drastic effects around the world, which is why you need more of a larger response, even a global response um, to control it. 
Let me go back. Okay, so the other main atmospheric process that I want to talk about are temperature inversions, right? And this is what likely caused those, those smog events that we looked at in the beginning, right? The Denora smog and the London smog. And what is happening is normally um, air near the ground gets warm during the daytime. It becomes warmer than air above it. And as it becomes warmer, it rises, right? It expands, becomes less dense, and it rises. And this causes turbulence or winds that circulate air, right? So this is the normal flow that you see right here. But what can happen at night or on cold days, air near the ground will cool more quickly than air above it. And when this happens, that cold air begins to sink, right? And it gets stuck above this layer of warmer air. And as a result, it traps whatever pollutants are in the area right here, right? So this cool air gets trapped above this warmer air. And now you get the buildup of pollutants. And you have smog events that still occur in areas in different cities around the world. And you have those smog events that we saw, right, in Donora and London, those particular ones. And in both of those cases, it was during these cold times where likely something like this occurred. All right. So important process, temperature inversion, and important uh, for those more acute cases, right, where you have these big smog events. Now. Um, I want to end by looking at what our response has been to air pollution, right? Both regulatory and then the steps that we have taken to reduce it, right? So from a regular regulatory standpoint, we have established in the United States the Clean Air Act. And this is a federal air quality law that was intended to reduce and control air pollution. And there's actually multiple Clean Air Acts or amendments to it. The first was in 1963. Then there was in 1970, which is basically what we consider the Clean Air Act. And there were amendments in 77 and 1990. And essentially, the Clean Air Act established the EPA as the organization that would regulate air quality, right? And, and what is happening is the Clean Air Act really just for established guidelines, and it left it up to the EPA to develop regulations to carry out these guidelines. So a little bit of the history. Um, the first Clean Air Act was established in 1963, and this extended funding for uh, prior air pollution research that had been started in 1955. So it extended this research into air pollution. It encouraged cooperation between the federal, state, and local governments, and it appropriated $95 million for states to develop their own pollution control programs. But a problem with this and a problem with what we saw is that first, that that pollution can cross state lines. Right. We saw it uh, because of those winds. That pollution isn't just bound to your state. So um, there was an issue with having states deal with independently because pollution was crossing state lines. And they realized that they needed to establish uh, a more federal response. Right. And that led to the 1970 Clean Air Act. Right. And in between there, there were some other um, air pollution acts. One to note is the 1965. There's a motor vehicle air pollution control act, which set the first emission standards for motor vehicles that have since become more stringent through time. But in 1970 is really what people think of when they think of the establishment of the Clean Air Act. And that is what uh, in during this 1970, that 1970 act established those national ambient air quality standards that we looked about that we that we've looked at already. Right. For our criteria pollutants. It also set new source performance standards, right? So any new equipment or facilities had to have a particular, they had to meet particular standards, right, for how much they were going to emit. It set standards for our hazardous air pollutants, those HAPs. And importantly, it gave the EPA this enforcement authority, right, to regulate this Clean Air Act. And it required states to develop these state implementation plans for how they're going to meet those national ambient air quality standards. Uh, so really important, right? Set the EPA in charge of regulating it, required states to meet these national ambient air quality standards. Now, since then, there have been amendments that I talked about. So in 1977, uh, there was the prevention of significant deterioration, right? So previously, we were concerned with cleaning up bad air, but this amendment said that we should also protect areas of good air, right? Excuse me, like wilderness areas or national parks, like air these pristine areas we want to protect. And there was also further amendments in 1990. 
We expanded those uh, standards for hazardous air pollutants. We created new programs to control acid deposition or acid rain, which I mentioned with that sulfur dioxide, right? And part of your uh, homework this uh, week is to read about the cap and trade program that we started to reduce sulfur dioxide. It's really interesting. There was also some modified, we modified how we permitted and we added those ozone layer protections, right, related to that Montreal protocol. So that's a clean act uh, history and a little bit of that Clean Air Act works, right? It's regulated by the EPA. They set standards and then states are required to meet those standards. So was it effective, right? What has been the result of this Clean Air Act? Where if we look down here, we have seen that our aggregate emissions for our six criteria pollutants has dropped dramatically since the initiation of the Clean Air Act, right? This is where they were at now relative to um, 1977 levels. There's been a huge drop in these aggregate emissions. And that comes with an increasing population, increasing for the most part energy consumption, uh, more vehicle miles traveled, uh, larger GDP. So we've had these growth in our population and, and our um, standard of living, but we've seen these uh, pollutants drop, which is a really great thing, right? And you can see some values here, right? 1970 is blue. And you see almost in all cases, except for this particle particulate matter uh, 10 here, we have seen decreases from the 1970s. Um, and where we stand currently, right? Here are our most recent national ambient air quality standards. All of them on a national level of our six um, criteria pollutants are below uh, the ambient air quality standards, which is a really great thing. It's kind of interesting to note that our particulate matter and our ozone have decreased the least amount, right? And I think, whoops, what that can be contributed to is the fact that these are those aggregate pollutants, right? So they're made up of a number of pollutants, so they're harder to control. And lastly, we can see if we're talking about, again, the economics of this, it is costly. The Clean Air Act has been costly. It's been billions of dollars in cost, but it's had even more um, billions of dollars worth of benefits, right? And you could see that outlined in this graph here, right? Where the costs are extreme, it's hard to say, but this isn't billions of dollars, right? So there are huge costs, but the benefits in terms of improved um, life expectancies and um, reductions in days of missed work or emergency room visits or hospital visits have been dramatic. And that's kind of what this is highlighting over here, right? The um, reductions in health impairment, right? So reductions in adult mortality, infant mortality, uh, bronchitis, heart disease, et cetera, all contributed to improvements in air quality related to the Clean Air Act. So how did we do this, right? That Clean Air Act and the EPA set these standards. How did we actually go about achieving them? Well, if you think about um, the causes of the majority of this air pollution that we looked at, right? Those causes were through the burning of fossil fuels for energy production and for transportation costs, right? And that's what we focused on to bring these levels under control, right? We focused on electricity generation and transportation. And by and large, we used technological changes in the way energy was produced or used to achieve this. And there are two kind of categories, right? We either changed the process or we um, created cleanup technologies. So if we're talking about changing the process, right? We shifted from being very coal-based to an increase in renewables and oil and natural gas, right? And as we said, coal is that huge dirty emitter of a lot of these pollutants. By switching to these more cleaner processes, um, we naturally reduced emissions, right? As an example, natural gas used as fuel emits about 60% less nitrogen oxides than coal and virtually no particulate matter or sulfur oxides, right? So just by switching to natural gas, we've seen a reduction in emissions, right? So that's part of changing the process, right? And this goes for, especially for switching to renewables. And we've also changed our fuel, right? So we have reduced the sulfur content in gasoline and diesel. Right. We and this has been by standards set by EPA. Right. So back in 2004, you could have 300 parts per million of sulfur in your fuel. Now you can have 10. Right. And same with diesel. You could have 500. Now you could have 15. Right. So we've 
uh, reduced, <coughs> excuse me, contents of um, chemicals that could be, that turn into these air pollutant emissions. Same just with sulfur content, uh, I mentioned unleaded gasoline, right? This was an effort that was started in the 70s, but 1996, leaded gas was fully banned in the U.S., right? And by removing lead from gasoline, drastic reduction in lead pollution. So we've changed the process, right? We've kind of switched to what we're burning, switched what we're using as fuel or altered it. And we've also adopted cleanup technologies. One of the big ones are scrubbers, right? So when we talk about cleanup technologies, most of these are uh, capturing the pollutants before they're being emitted, right? Or as they're being emitted. So examples are scrubbers, right? And these are scrubbers that remove pollutants. Uh, particularly, they are common in sulfur dioxide, so at coal plants, but they will also scrub nitrogen oxides and VOCs. There are different types of scrubbers. And what they do is during these industrial processes or these electrical generation processes, as those emissions are flowing through, right, they may be flowing, they'll flow into a scrubber. And then that scrubber is going to capture those emissions before it gets released into the atmosphere. Uh, as an example, and they're very effective, right? So a, a CO2 scrubber can remove 90 to 90 percent of uh, sulfur dioxide emissions uh, uh, by being used, right? And it's actually really neat. It sprays a mixture of limestone and water, and then we're able to use, that creates gypsum, and then we use that gypsum in drywall and in making cement and agriculture, right? So it has uses, uh, more so than just cleaning uh, sulfur dioxide. So that's an example of a scrubber in an industrial process, but then we've also used them in our cars, right? Because again, our cars were major pollutants, that tailpipe emissions. Your catalytic converter, it is very important um, as a type of scrubber, right? They became standard on new cars in 1975, and they scrub nitrogen oxides, unburned hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide, and they convert them to water, natural gas, and carbon dioxide. Now, again, that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which we'll talk about, but it did have the effect of reducing carbon monoxide levels, hydrocarbons, and nitrogen, oxi uh, nitrogen oxides, right? So you can see down here, New vehicles today emit 96% less carbon monoxide, 98% less hydrocarbons, 90% nitrogen oxides than new vehicles in the 1970s, right? So this is really these technological advances, either changing what we were burning or taking things out of what we were burning or adding these uh, end of tailpipe emissions, right? Either scrubbers or catalytic converters in cars really work to reduce the amount of air pollutants, particularly our criteria pollutants. What you can you do to reduce air pollution, right? A lot of these are behavioral things that you can do um, uh, for these criteria pollutants. And when we're talking about this ambient air quality, uh, I mean, it's kind of stuff that you would think, right? Most of our, our issues, right, come from the burning of uh, fossil fuels for transportation or electricity. So anything that you can do to reduce that is going to help in a way to reduce air pollution, right? So if it comes from transportation, try and take more public transportation or advocate for better public transportation as well. Buy more fuel efficient vehicles or electric vehicles, carpool, right? Advocate for renewable energy. We're going to talk about energy uh, later on. But we saw these pollutants are the result of burning fossil fuels, and we don't have those emissions with a lot of our renewables. Um, so advocate for that, right? Like I said, <laughs> excuse me, try and reduce your energy consumption where you can. And these are all ways that you can help reduce these ambient air quality uh, pollutants. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about air pollution in New Jersey. We're going to see how we stand compared to the other states. And we are also going to look at indoor air pollution and things that you may not be realized that you're being exposed to air pollution in your own homes and ways you can reduce that as well. So that is it. Um, I will see you guys on the next lecture.